it take for the United States to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions? Conceptually, it's simple. We put only as much greenhouse gas into the atmosphere in a year as we remove from it. Today, we're emitting about 6 billion tons per year more than we're removing, so we've got a big job ahead of us. A couple of years ago, I had no idea, like most people, I suspect, how we actually do this. But I'm an engineer, and engineers learn to first define a problem well in order to solve it. So I ended up co-leading a multidisciplinary team of 18 researchers at Princeton and elsewhere in a two-year effort to define how the U.S. can build a net zero economy by 2050. The good news is that there are many pathways for getting there, using technologies we already understand. What's more, we can do this spending on energy as a fraction of GDP, no more than what we spend now. We identified five very different pathways that achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Some people will like our high electrification pathway. Others will like our 100% renewables option, or the option where nuclear power is prominent. We don't have a favorite among these pathways. Each gets us to our goal. Each pathway is different, but all rely to greater or lesser extent on six pillars of decarbonization. The first is increased energy efficiency and electrification especially in transport and buildings, but also in industry. Here's an example of the scale of change required. Today, there are less than 2 million plug-in electric vehicles on U.S. roads. By 2050, we'll need 200 million or more. The second pillar is clean electricity. In just one decade, we'll need to double the share of electricity that comes from carbon-free sources. And by 2050, we'll be generating at least twice as much electricity in total as today, much of it from the sun and the wind. That also means we'll need more power sources we can call up on demand, like hydrogen turbines and batteries. We'll also need to greatly expand transmission capacity. Today's transmission grid took over 100 years to build. We'll need to at least double its size in the next 15 years, and then add as much again in the following 15. By 2050, half to two-thirds of our end-use energy will still be fuels, not electricity. But unlike fuels today, the fuels will need to be clean fuels, which is our third pillar. Clean means fuels with no net emissions, like hydrogen made by splitting water using clean electricity, or hydrocarbon synthesized from sustainably grown biomass. The fourth pillar is carbon capture, utilization, and storage. By 2050, we'll need to be capturing at least 1 billion tons of CO2 annually. This is a huge amount, equivalent to one quarter of the volume of all U.S. oil and gas production today. Most of this CO2 will be injected deep underground into geological formations for permanent storage. We'll need a carbon capture and transport industry to handle all this CO2. A fledgling version of this industry exists today with 5,000 miles of CO2 pipelines. We'll need an order of magnitude larger industry by 2050. We'll also need to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases other than CO2, like methane, nitrous oxides, and fluorocarbons. This is the fifth pillar. There are a variety of ways to do this, like changing crop and livestock farming practices, but eliminating these emissions entirely will be difficult, which brings me to the final pillar. Increasing the amount of carbon absorbed by agricultural and forestry lands. This helps offset emissions we can't eliminate. The potential offsets are significant, one estimate is that half a billion tons of CO2 could be removed annually by changing management practices across 300 million acres of our forests. The scale and pace of change needed across each of these six pillars is extraordinary. And of course, there are so many reasons why we might fail to meet the challenge. We identified four of the biggest risks. The first is that we fail to change the practices and regulations that today prevent physical assets and infrastructure being deployed at the unprecedented pace required. Typically, an individual developer today proposes a project, and then government agencies and local communities take a long time to tell them all the reasons they can't build it. We'll need something very different from this one-at-a-time approach to development and approval of projects. A second and related risk is not being able to mobilize the capital investments we need in the time we have. I mentioned that the transition looks affordable. It is, but unlike the past, much more of our energy spending needs to be in the form of upfront capital investment instead of operating costs. At least $2.5 trillion in additional capital, beyond business-as-usual investments, must be deployed by 2030 alone. If we're to mobilize and deploy such unprecedented levels of capital, we'll need to figure out how to de-risk projects for investors. 
A third big risk is failing to earn and sustain public support and social license for the needed transformations of our energy system. I was chatting recently with Art Cullen, who's an editor of a small town newspaper in northwestern Iowa. His state has reaped significant economic benefits from wind energy, but Art tells me there is now serious and growing public opposition to wind energy there, stemming from concerns about aesthetic, environmental, and other impacts. The fourth risk is political backlash from the loss of fossil fuel jobs. Our modeling shows that across the U.S. there will be many more jobs gained in clean energy than lost in fossil fuel sectors, but there are large regions like the Gulf Coast and Appalachia that see net job losses as fossil fuel industries decline. If the transition is to succeed, we will need to be especially attentive to how these regions are cared for. If you want to learn more about our study, a link to our report is pinned to the top of the chat window to the right-hand side of your screen. I'm overwhelmed at times by the size of the challenge our work has mapped out. To meet this challenge, we will need to combine moonshot-like mission-driven public-private partnerships with the kind of bold government leadership that built the foundations of the U.S. 20th century economy, a process that spanned the New Deal, the industrial mobilization for World War II, and post-war investments in national infrastructure. The private sector has essential roles to play in this effort. Corporate net zero pledges, accompanied by transparent action plans and progress reporting, are important, but companies also need to engage with stakeholders. Governments at all levels, investors, community organizations, labor unions, environmental groups, and others. Multi-stakeholder collaborations are needed, united by a common net zero objective and recognition that the gains and the pains of the transition must be shared equitably. We can reach the net zero greenhouse gas balance I talked about at the start if we come together in this way as a country. Our study provides a blueprint for what we need to do together to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. <laughs>